Moving on to chapter 13, we're going to talk more about the biological changes in adulthood. Basically, what changes are you physiologically going to have? And also, what changes in society will you be experiencing? So the first one, of course, is going to be a change of appearance. We know that, you know, 40-ish is the middle age time. There we begin to see some wrinkles. We may start seeing gray hairs, possible baldness in men. And even women's hair will become very, very thin. What is interesting is that people don't realize that they're going to begin to gain a lot of weight between their 30s and 50s as their metabolism slows down. So those pounds easily creep up. Not only is our metabolism slowing down, but generally our whole lifestyle is slowing down because we're spending more time at work, which often means that we're sitting further um, or sitting longer, I should say. Um, also that our jobs quite often are less stressful than what we were doing before as far as physical activity. So before you may have been playing sports or running around with friends and today you basically watch your kids and run after your one year old. One of the diseases that your book talks about is osteoporosis. And this is an example of where basically the bones become more porous and easily break. This image that is in your book really kind of gives you a good idea of how you can see what a solid bone mass looks like versus this weakened bone mass. As that bone mass weakens, it will become much easier for you to break your hips, to break your legs, to break pretty much anything. As osteoporosis gets worse, we'll also see it begin to affect the spine. That's quite why you see some older women who are very hunched over, but don't think this is a woman's only disease, although it is more prevalent in women because of bone loss that they may um, obtain during uh, pregnancy. This also occurs in men. Quite often for men though, because they don't think about it happening to them, it isn't caught as early. Arthroarthritis is basically a degenerative disease. Um, what they call it wear and tear. Now, in this case, I've shown an example of a hip joint where we can see that the joint has basically worn out. Here in Florida, because of the amount of seniors we have, artificial joints and artificial hips are not uncommon because the disease basically kills those joints. Now, what is interesting is that there are certain joints that this does not affect. However, things like the hand, the spines, the hip, the knees, those are very much affected. So, rheumatoid arthritis though is different. Now, this is an actual disease that is of the joint. Now, the picture that you see here shows sort of three different things. You see your healthy joint first. You see arthritis, where you begin to see basically that breaking down of that layer that's a cushion. But then rheumatoid arthritis, as you can see, is an inflammation that goes around the joint. Unfortunately, this is incurable. They can slow it down, but they can't stop it. The other thing you might notice, the difference between arthritis arthritis versus rheumatoid arthritis, is the size of the joint. Now, the amount of space, you might want to say, that the joint takes up appears to be the same. It may even look larger. Unfortunately, underneath that inflammation, you can see that the actual joint is getting smaller. It's extremely painful because you can also see they've lost all their cushioning. As far as reproductive changes are concerned, we know that this is a time period where women will begin to lose their ability to have children. You have to be very careful. Women do not go through menopause. When they are in menopause, their periods have stopped. No ifs, ands, or buts, no more periods. Going through that time period where we go from having regular periods to being stopped is called premenopausal. Basically, that's the transition. However, because of television shows, we tend to think of menopause as being this, this transition phase. Be very careful. Menopause, you have stopped. No longer having any more menstruation cycles. That period of time is premenopausal. Oh, stress. Well, we have a lot of stress. And as we know, stress tends to be something that negatively affects us. Now, what we tend to do is we tend to use some sort of different coping methods, hopefully to get rid of stress. Now, we've already talked about emotional versus problem-focused coping. And really, the big thing is, is the less stress as we can get rid of, 
the better off that we are going to be basically physically. However, this may take a bit of time because we can also find that there are aspects of middle life which tend to create more stress than normal, including having kids. And we're going to talk about your parents coming back into the life. The other thing that begins to be more noticed at this time is what we call practical intelligence. Now, practical intelligence tends to be this real world ability. You might call it common sense. What we haven't really talked very much about is two primary types of intelligences, fluid and crystal intelligence. Got to know these. These will be basically with you for the rest of your at least academic studies. So fluid intelligence is our ability to reason, our ability for abstract solving problems. We actually get pretty good at this in our middle age because we have enough experience to solve things. So if you go back to Piaget and we think about the fact that he talked about formal stage and the formal stage is where we begin to get abstract. We have now some practice. So by middle age, our fluid intelligence is pretty good. Crystal intelligence, on the other hand, think of those like your encyclopedias or your dictionary. So crystal intelligence is something that you gather as you move along. Unfortunately, fluid intelligence will be at its height in your middle age. Crystal intelligence, A, hey, that's just going up. You might have remember seeing the chart that I have at the bottom of the slide where we have two different types of intelligences. You can see right there again that crystal intelligence is only going to get better the older we get. And yet our fluid intelligence does go down a little bit, basically it decreases in age because of the actual structure of our brain. The structure of our brain begins to change, our synapses begin to change, things just begin to slow down a little bit. So we are also going to see sort of a slowdown in fluid intelligence. However, we're probably not going to see a real drop off in fluid intelligence, as I said before, until our 70s. And maybe then we begin to see a real drop off. A lot of times when we think that somebody is just dropping off in fluid intelligence, it's really more just an non-desire you might want to say to deal with something new or unique after all what they're doing works so why should they change so you may not have been able to convince them yet to change that the new way is better than the old way maybe better for you it doesn't always mean it's better for them and we'll approach that a little bit more when we start talking about seniors the nice thing to look forward to if you're not there yet at middle age is that this is when you'll be at sometimes your peak academic and mental performance. We find a lot of experts tend to be in this time frame. Now, it doesn't mean it's right at 40, somewhere between 40 and 50 we tend to see. You're still um, young enough in that you kind of know the new and modern things coming up, but at the same point, you've been around long enough to have a history and to have collected a lot of crystal intelligence. The five factor model, which is also known as OCEAN, O-C-E-A-N, is one that you'll be using quite a lot if you're in the nursing program. Why? Because when you evaluate your patients, you're going to be using OCEAN. So please make sure you do take a better look at this in your book. It's got a really nice uh, diagram in there and a little bit more description perhaps. So these five factors we have to understand is that there's always like an opposite factor. So if you're not open to experience, then you're probably closed minded. If you're not an extrovert, you're probably an introvert. So the reason they came up with the five factor model is you also have to think about back in our memory. When we talked about memory, we talked about the seven bit effect that most people can remember seven things pretty easily, which is why telephone numbers were originally seven digits. Well, they were trying to get it down to sort of this boil down five factor area. And so these were the five primary factors. So if I'm dealing with a patient who tends to be pretty high in agreeableness, but maybe a little bit um, low on extrovert, which means that they're probably high on introvert, they may be very agreeable, but they're going to want you to sort of talk to them about it. And they're going to be much more interested in why this occurs than how this may interact with society. So this five factor model really helps us get a good sort of overview of what a personality is going to be like and gives us some idea of sort of how to work with somebody. Again, highly recommend that you review this. Um, I'm also going to see if we can't find a good video for you to watch.
In middle age, you've hit Erickson's seventh phase. Here, he says the shift has to be away from basically yourself and focusing more toward parenting, mentoring, basically the generation behind you. He says people who have that inability to sort of leave their youth behind and begin to focus more on their current needs or unable to deal with uh, basically the needs of their children or, or other people behind them, they're going to become stagnated. And when they become stagnated, they'll tend to become depressed because they're more focused on what has happened. You know, I used to be a great football player. I used to have this. I used to have that. And he says, if we just focus on the past, the stagnation occurs and we don't move forward. So that would become a crisis. What he really says is that if we begin to focus ourselves on supporting the next generation and focusing on how we support that and how we move that forward, then we're going to probably be happier and find that moving into the next phase of our life much easier. So a lot of this has to do with your ego resiliency. Now we've talked about this before. Ego resiliency is basically your ability to cope with whatever stress, adversaries, transitions that you have. And the higher your ego resiliency, the better that you will be able to maintain a more tranquil life. Now, there is sort of this thought that people have these midlife crises, and as we've discovered, yeah, that's not true. <laughs> um, we might have what we call a midlife correction. Basically, what happens is, is that we get to a certain point in our life, and we may start questioning whether or not this is how we want the rest of our lives to go. For women, quite often this happens a little bit earlier. It may happen in their 30, uh, late 20s, early 30s, because of bearing children. If they haven't had children at this point, and they've decided that they do want to have children, they have to start thinking about whether or not they want to have have them pretty soon because if they don't then they may not be able to bear them themselves now there's nothing wrong with adopting a child but this is just what ha happens with women is that they have to start making that choice is it that I want to stay on this course or do I want to change this course for men this may come a little bit later for them as far as this course correction in part a lot of times it happens once the children have left the house what occurs is that we now as empty nesters because the children have left are sometimes have freedoms we haven't had in a long time we also tend to be pretty profitable at that point meaning is is that we're in pretty high income we um, don't have to support our children like we did before and we're doing pretty well sort of at work quite often so it may allow us to perhaps do something we wanted to try before. I mean, if I'm only 40, maybe now is the time for me to try that new job that I've been wanting to try, but I wanted to keep job security while my kids were in the house or while they were at college. Uh, maybe I've always wanted to try being, um, I don't know, I wanted to try repairing cars and I've never really gotten to do that before. So now I've got the money and the time to buy this car to fix it up. What's also interesting is, as far as relationships are concerned, if we have a pretty solid marriage after the children have left the house, we also find that men and women are more likely to spend time apart and be okay with spending time apart. At this point, um, wives may say, yeah, go have your boys night out and be happy that you're having your boys night out. And men are like, yeah, go have your ladies night out and, you know, kind of be happy to be by themselves. We don't have to have that constant need of our companion being with us. So it also, again, opens us up to perhaps try things and do things we haven't done before. So in the movie theaters and on TV dramas, it looks great to have these midlife crises because let's face it, it's a lot more exciting to watch that than to watch a happy couple. But the truth is that for most people, if they've made it through their marriage and the kids have left, that we're going to see sort of a correction to see some dreams or other things that may we may want to change maybe we don't need the big house anymore maybe we've always wanted to live in a different state we have sort of more freedom you might want to say to make a change or correction in where we're going unfortunately being in midlife also tends to bring you into what we call the sandwich generation the sandwich generation basically says you might still have some kids at home, but you may also begin to have your parents, the grandparents, coming back to live with you. 
multi-generational homes, as we know, are far more common around the world than they are here in the United States. But we're beginning to see more and more of that coming to Florichon, where we see parents coming back to live with their children. Houses with two master suites is becoming very common for builders to build because we know one master suite will be for the grandparents and one will be for the parents. In part, it's because of the cost of nursing homes for older parents. And with the parents coming back to live with, with their kids for as long as they can, it can also help kids or in this case, the parents in this particular model that we see here, take care of perhaps younger children. And so if the grandparents could take care of the younger children while the parents are at work, then Kajing, that makes it better for everybody. So the sandwich generation though also has a lot of unique stresses. So as we are caring for our parents, we have this thing called the filibury obligation. And this is a person who feels like they're required to take care of their parents. There's almost always some adult in the family who will feel that it's their responsibility to take care of their parents because their parents took care of them. It does mean that you have to change your lifestyle. It becomes perhaps a matter of how do I balance both taking care of my child and taking care of my aging parent at the same time? This is where we see a lot of women leaving jobs in the middle of their careers. And also one of the reasons why it may be harder for women to sort of make the money that men have made. At some point, somebody has to take on the obligation of taking care of the child and or taking care of the parent or both. If the women are leaving the workforce, they may be leaving for five, six, seven years at a time. And then when they come back in, see, they have much less experience than the men have had who have not left the workforce. That is one reason why we're seeing a lot more women trying to take jobs which allow them to work from home or even trying to request having more paid time off to take care of people. Um, it used to be that basically just the women would get things like FMLA. Now a lot more men are also applying for FMLA as life has adjusted to being a little bit more equal as far as that's concerned. As far as grandparents are concerned, well, I love the grandparent sticker or the sticker I saw once that said, if I had known being a grandparent was this much fun, I would have started with them first. Basically, there is a fun time for grandparents to take care of their grandkids. As we like to say, you get to do all the fun things, all the messy things, and then give them back <laughs> to their parents to clean them up and full of sugar. But a lot of times grandparents feel like they're the family historians and that they need to teach these uh, family histories to their kids. Uh, quite often, they're also the ones who can teach certain skills. If parents are working, they're going to be the, ch the one who teaches them how to cook. They may be the one who teaches them all kinds of things. So it's kind of interesting in that grandparents become quite connected with their grandchildren and the helping in the raising of the grandchildren, especially as we have two parent incomes. Well, this is the end of chapter 13. We will see you for chapter 14 shortly.